By January 1959, the Soviets had begun preparations for human spaceflight, and while the American space program was focusing on developing spy satellites or satellites that would later be used for commercial purposes, such as for example radio communication, the Soviets decided that it was actually best to try to put living creatures, and specifically human beings, into space. But before such a manned mission could be launched, extensive tests were necessary, and so the Soviets began to develop the spacecraft capable of reaching the orbit with a living being on board. This was the beginning of the Vostok program, and their first craft was actually called Vostok K. This was better known as Korabl Sputnik 1 in the Soviet Union or Sputnik 4 in the United States of America. Today we're going to be talking about this particular ship and how it changed the history of spaceflight. Welcome to What the Math. In April of 1960, Sergei Korolev, who was the chief designer of the Soviet rockets, working for what was then known as OKB-1, which was basically a name of a company responsible for making all of those rockets, had completed a draft for his Vostok spacecraft that would eventually launch Gagarin into space. But this first model was known as Vostok 1K, which was actually very similar to the final version with a few modifications, and was essentially a spacecraft capable of launching a small spherical capsule into space uh, inside of which you could actually place anything from animals to one human being. And so of course you actually had to test the spacecraft before you could put a human in there because if this was a cat catastrophic launch this would actually look really bad for the United Soviet Socialist Republic. And so they decided to launch a craft with nothing but a human dummy inside with uh, a few simple artifacts and also a pre-recorded voice that would actually transmit radio messages from the craft to Earth so that they could actually test its performance in flight. And here is actually where the first limitation came into place. How would you actually track a spacecraft flying around the Earth at every single moment? And so they actually decided to place seven very large naval vessels, uh, we're talking about uh, naval ships, around the globe and they actually placed them in such a location that they could, they could actually track the spacecraft quite effectively without losing sight of it at any moment. And so this first variant of the spacecraft known as Vostok K was uh, not really designed to be recovered from orbit and was a simple test of this design and also its performance during the flight. Now Korolev actually wanted to call this Korabl Sputnik, which in Russian means satellite ship, but eventually it became known as uh, Sputnik 4 and this is actually the name that stuck to it in Western media and around the world as well. And the name Vostok was actually still secret and still not known to anyone except for Korolev and his small team, so that name was actually not used at all until later on in 1961. And this particular rocket was designed in a very similar fashion to like the previous Soviet spacecraft. It was basically based on the R-7 ICBM rocket that Korolev invented a few years prior and was a very successful design that uh, had very few failure rates and has already seen quite a lot of successful launches. This of course was a very similar craft that launched the famous dog into space and was now ready to launch a human being as well. And although this particular craft was actually unmanned, um, it was a precursor to the first human flight and had a very very similar design to the final mission which was later known as Vostok 1. However, not everything went perfect with this launch and by the time this craft reached orbit, uh, the mission control realized that there was actually a bug in the guidance system which had an unfortunately pointed the capsule in the wrong direction, so, so instead of firing a retrograde boosters and trying to re-enter atmosphere, it instead increased the apoapsis and propelled the craft into higher orbit, which meant that it actually spends quite a lot of time in space instead of trying to re-enter atmosphere. So the descent module actually re-entered atmosphere in 1962 or two years later and a piece of this module was later found somewhere in the United States in the state of Wisconsin. A small piece actually crashed into the road and you can actually find the little marking where the piece was found later on. But the main mission was however a success because the mission here was to investigate the means for the manned spacecraft to deliver human beings into the orbit. And so on board of the ship there were quite a lot of scientific instruments. There 
there was a TV system, there was a self-sustaining biological cabin filled with oxygen, and of course there was a little dummy of a man that was supposed to represent a human being on board. And interestingly, this capsule was continuously transmitting pre-recorded voice commands just to see if it was actually possible to receive signal from this craft and also send signals back to it. But due to the secrecy of the Soviet Union and because this was actually right in the middle of the Cold War, this is where a lot of conspiracy theories started to pop up. Specifically here, we're talking about a conspiracy theory called the Lost Cosmonauts. This is a theory that basically claims that there were quite a lot of Soviet astronauts that were launched into space and actually died prior to Gagarin. Um, and because Soviet Union was so good at covering things up, they actually erased them from history. So this is basically a theory that says that even prior to Gagarin, there were a lot of people in space, but none of them survived. So Gagarin was possibly the first astronaut to survive space re-entry, not the first uh, man in space. And this first theory was actually started by an, an Italian from Turin by the name of Giovanni Cordiglia, who actually detected these signals from his amateur radio stations and then reported them back to it, uh, Italian newspapers. And they actually claimed that there was, a, there was a real man, there was an actual human being on board of Sputnik 4. But because Soviet Union was so secretive, they actually didn't tell anyone that this was a pre-recorded voice communication. It, was, it wasn't actually a human being. But this didn't stop the conspiracy theory from starting and this is actually how it all began and this is how a lot of people today still think that Yuri Gagarin was not the first man in space. There were quite a lot of uh, other phantom cosmonauts, or I, I guess you can call them lost co cosmonauts or astronauts, that were considered to be lost in space for one reason or another, but many of them are just theories and are very likely not to be true. And we're actually going to discuss them in one of the future videos where we'll just talk about all of these possible theories and whether they're possibly true or possibly completely wrong. But let's actually get back to this mission itself and talk a little bit about its success and why it was so important. So this uh, spacecraft was designed to study the operation of the life support system and various stresses during the flight. And so during the four days of flight, it actually managed to return a lot of data about the space flight, about the temperature and also atmosphere inside the capsule, and also reported back a lot of data that basically helped the Soviet scientists uh, realize that it was quite possible and quite safe to put a real human being into space and then this person will be able to safely return back to Earth and essentially not die. But nevertheless, the most important test, which of course was the test of the parachute and the re-entry, was not actually tested on this particular mission. Even though the capsule was able to test the uh, internal compartment and all of the other equipment, unfortunately due to the failure of re-entry module and because the actual spacecraft stayed in space for something like two more years, and actually one of the modules stayed for, in space for um, five years until 1965, this was the equipment module which actually re-entered five years later. So because of these failures, Years, the actual re-entry system was not actually tested during this mission and another mission had to be launched afterwards. And this particular mission actually was launched only three months later and was known as Karabul Sputnik 2, also known as Sputnik 5 in the West. And this is a mission I actually described in more detail before when I was talking about various Soviet dogs. This was the mission that essentially launched animals into orbit and then returned them back safely to Earth. And so this particular mission, Karabul Sputnik 2, also known as Sputnik 5, carried two dogs into space. Uh, these were Belka and Strelka, the uh, infamous two dogs that actually returned from space. There were also 40 mice, two rats, and a variety of different plants on board all of which were actually filmed on a TV camera just to see how they would perform in space. And what's really interesting is that uh, this particular mission, Sputnik 5 mission, actually had another secondary uh, mission here, and the mission was to intercept the US Echo satellite, about which I talked in the previous video. This was the uh, nitrogen-filled balloon that would actually fly really, really high up in the atmosphere. And interestingly, when Belka and Strelka saw this balloon pass by in the little window that they had, they actually started started barking and all of this was captured on the camera. But I think we can actually talk about this mission in one of the future videos because this particular video was all about Vostok K, also known as Sputnik 4. And anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something more about it. And just to give you more idea on what I actually used here, I did use a mod called Soviet Rockets and Soviet Probes and this was a mod developed by a person named Bobcat. He actually has a really cool mod that you can install in your Kerbal Space 
space program that will give you really really awesome soviet probes and also soviet rockets and if you did enjoy this video check out some of the other history of space flight videos i posted previously also don't forget to subscribe because there's a lot more kerbal space program and a lot more history of space videos coming in the future anyway thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in the next video game you later and bye bye